Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. I'm back from cruising, so that means it's time for another show. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to talk about free PBX, the PBX system that it gets interfaced with a GUI, controls asterisk, and can run all your small office to huge system needs. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 276, recorded December 11th, 2013. Free PBX. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I'm your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneNinja.com, bringing you as often as I can the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day, projects you may never have heard of, and sometimes that even invites people to use new things. Very awesome. I'm back. I'm back. I've been gone on a couple of cruises. I hope, uh, hope I was at least missed by a few of you out there. I missed all you been doing this job. I still have one more cruise coming up before the year's end, uh, and I'm kind of happy to be on land for a week or so. I'm uh, back down in Culver City working, in fact, for the guy that puts the cruises on, my friend Captain Neil. Uh, and I'm also on a clear wire hotspot, which may actually cause trouble during the show, so please forgive us if my video or my audio is a little more dodgy than it normally is. Uh, always joined by a co-host, no exception to this week. Gareth Greenaway, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Good. Glad to be back. Cool, cool. And uh, where are you? Well, I think I know where you're speaking to us from. You're up in Thousand Oaks, right? Yep, still in Thousand Oaks. Uh, a, yep. a cool morning in Thousand Oaks um, this morning. It's, well, cool, uh, of course, by, by, by SoCal standards, right? Well, yeah. I mean, cold is a relative term, but yeah, it's, it's cold by California standards. Cool, cool. Well, we have a really exciting project today. It's called Free PBX. And uh, I was just given a note from the marketing director moments ago to be able to give you sort of the quick view of all I know about it, which is that it's, a, uh, it's based on Asterisk. And Asterisk, of course, itself is just an engine. And what Free PBX adds to that is the PBX capabilities, dial plan logic, and extra features that turn into a PBX and all managed from a nice GUI. Uh, I don't know much about this otherwise. I've been staring at the website for about uh, 45 minutes, and uh, there's a lot of details there but not a lot of the high-level view. And so we'll have to get that from the guests when we bring them on in a few minutes. Uh, have you sorted this out at all, Gareth? I have not looked at free, BP, free PBX at all. Um, <laughs> I, I played with Asterix um, in the past, and mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's a really awesome piece of software. Um, and I know there's been a few different uh, projects like free, BP, free, P, free PBX. Um, <laughs> it's a tongue Tough twister. To in the morning, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, but no, no, I'm, I'm definitely interested to hear what our, what our guests have to say about it. Well, I think the best way to do that is to go ahead and bring them on. Let's go ahead and bring on Tony Lewis. Tony, welcome to the show. Hello. Okay, uh, and uh, what is your relationship with uh, the project? Um, I'm actually the, the CEO of Schmoozcom Inc., which is the uh, corporate sponsor of the, of the Free PBX project. Okay, and you heard my sort of awkward explanation based on only one sentence that was sent to me. Can you uh, sort of fill us in a little bit? What's How does this fit in with the world of telephony and VoIP and PBXs? Uh, free PBX uh, at a high level is, is a management interface to asterisk, we'll call it. Um, but it also is much more than that. It, it does a lot of the business logic for asterisk to figure out what the features are in the PBX. Asterisk is kind of your, your engine that gives you the toolkit, but you have to build your features so it's kind of what free PBX does and presents it into a GUI to manage and set up your phone system. Um, it's actually been around since 2005, even before my time. We've been involved in the project since 2007. Um, we've been uh, one of the lead developers on the project since 2008. And uh, shortly, about a year ago, um, there was another corporate sponsor involved in free PBX. We purchased the domain name and trademark from them and kind of the, the only corporate sponsor behind the project currently. Great. Well, I've got a lot more questions for you, but I also don't want to leave out our other guest, Andrew Nagy. Welcome to the show. Hi. Nice to be here. Hi. Where are you speaking to us from? I am in uh, Anaheim, California. Oh, so you're just a stone's throw from me because I'm over am, just, yeah. at, just west of Culver, Culver City. So, Or just, yeah. just south, south of Culver City, yeah. Uh, so uh, what's your relationship with the project? 
I, uh, I'm a developer for Schmoozcom, so I work for Tony. Um, I was actually involved with the project as just an open source contributor since 2009 till around uh, October of last year. Uh, and then I got involved part-time and then full-time with Schmoozcom. Cool. And what brought you to uh, PrePBX as an open source contributor? What was, what was appealing to it for you? <clears throat> um, I got involved because I was uh, working at an entertainment company and they had a phone system there. And I really wanted to figure out what it was because it was behind um, – well, all the phones were connected over Ethernet lines. I didn't understand what that was at the time um, in terms of like VoIP. I didn't understand VoIP. Um, so I slowly started to hack it apart, and I figured out eventually that it was free PBX. And then I just wanted to start contributing to improve features for my own company's stuff. And then I left that company, and I've just been involved ever since. And uh, just so uh, we can bring everybody up to speed, I, I know all the answers to these things, but what, what's VoIP and how does it differ from a, say, traditional phone system? Uh, VoIP is uh, voice over IP. Um, it's making a telephone call really over Ethernet um, or data lines. Um, you can also, it's, it's in, a, in a PBX standpoint, an asterisk or free PBX standpoint, you can still make calls over PSTN, which is a local copper lines. You can make it over T1 lines, which are, are digital um, lines that sometimes carry internet, sometimes don't, or you can also do it over, you know, SIP or VoIP. I mean, it's all different types of VoIP. So it's really comes down to making calls over the internet instead of doing it the tra traditional way over uh, copper lines. So uh, Asterisk by <clears throat> itself doesn't have the kind of functionality that FreePBX is bringing to it in terms of having some sort of way to configure it and having a GUI to it? Uh, Asterisk has no GUI anymore. They used to have one uh, a while back. They have no GUI ah. anymore. Uh, these days, um, it just when you get Asterisk, you get the engine, and they expect you to pull up a notepad or an editor and start writing dial plan is what they call it, which is their, their code language. Uh, FreePBX itself generates that code language, that dial plan, from people uh, configuring an online GUI that we've designed. Okay, and... Um Let's go back to uh, Tony for a second. Um, what's, how is Schmoozcom involved then? You said it's it, a corporate sponsor. How, how does that relationship work? Uh, everything from marketing, uh, management of the website, the, the infrastructure that runs free PBX, the, the 30, I think it's about 30 different servers that make up the free PBX infrastructure from websites and YUM servers and repos and uh, server uh, monitoring servers and servers that provision other servers. Um, so we handle all that. And then most of the development in free PBX, similar to, to Asterisk being done by Digium employees, the sponsor of Asterisk, most of the development in free PBX is done by developers that work and are paid for by Schmoozcom. Okay. Now, uh, using the free is in free beer version of the word, if I downloaded the free PBX distro, what could I do with it? What problems could I solve with it? You can create a full-fledged PBX, um, register your extensions to it, bring in some trunking, whether that's analog lines, um, SIP trunking, T1s, PRIs, anything, and build your IVRs, build ACD queuing, conference rooms, one-on-one um, -on -one video calls, Almost anything you can dream of in a PBX, the stock open source free PBX will do for you. Okay, so then, uh, but, but I would have to host this in my own servers and do my own high availability management and things like that, right? Uh, correct. You would, you would install this on your own server. Uh, we do have a partnership with a, a data center company. You can get free PBX hosted in a data center designed by us and the hosting company. Um, I think it starts about 20 bucks, 25 bucks a month for that service. Well, I saw a lot of plugins for this that looked like they were commercial plugins. What would some of those be and, and what, what other problems does those solve? So most of the commercial modules are vertical market features or enhancing features inside of free PBX with things that customers have specifically asked for. Um, commercial modules are designed as a way to help pay for this free PBX ecosystem and all the work that the developers and in, in Schmooze as a company does for the project. Um, so generally commercial modules are more lateral market or specific higher end features that your average small and medium sized business wouldn't need. Okay, and uh, what, what, who are the, who are the other players in this, in this marketplace? Are there, are there any other open source players in this marketplace? Oh, I'm, 
I'm sure there are. I mean, free PBX itself is used by lots of different players. Meaning um, if you download Asterisk now from the Digium website, it includes free PBX. Uh, PBX in a flash by Ward Mundy is free PBX. Elastics yeah. is free PBX. Trixbox, which isn't around anymore, was based on free PBX. All those projects use our GUI code base. Wow. Uh, are you familiar with Ascosia? I am not, no. Okay, we had them on the show about uh, two years ago, and it sounds like a really similar offering, so I was just sort of wondering if they were free PBX. Probably not, then, if you are not familiar with them. Um, what about something like Finality? Would that be similar? Uh, Finality's Trixbox was built on top of free PBX. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Um, and so how... How is the organization governed? I mean, obviously, you know, you're paying the bills. Schmoozcom is paying the bills. So does Schmoozcom decide the roadmap? Um, to a reason it does. I mean, we take feedback. We we have a complete bug and feature tracker um, donated by Atlassian, the, the same software Digium and lots of other open source projects use. So people create features. People can submit patches and, and features that they've built back into the product. Um, you know, we kind of take our cue from our feature and bug tracker. I know the the last, I believe it was the 2.11 um, release that went out early this year. Um, I believe it was about 75% of all the features and bug reports that we closed were opened by community members. So we, we kind of try to take our cue from the community members. So going back to the um, the the kind of what what free PBX is um, kind of like a, a a manager for a lot of the configuration of Asterix. Um, one of the things that I had found in the past in my work with with Asterix in using a lot of these um, a lot of the, the front ends that kind of manage that is they work really well as long as I was kind of staying within their. Um, their wall garden in terms of what I could do. How does free, B free PBX handle a, a situation like that? Like if I want to, if I want to do something beyond what its uh, its management system allows me to do. Well, two ways we handle it, and it's funny. This morning I was just actually talking to Malcolm from Digium, and we're talking about complex features and how complex features and flexibility creates a very ugly GUI. And free PBX, lots of us will call it an ugly GUI, meaning it gives you so much rope you can hang yourself. We allow you to hook in anywhere. So a module can call another module and send destinations. You, you can almost build anything from the GUI with the, with the ability of how modules can hook into another module and create your call flow. And then if you need to get really customized, everything we do includes, we, we build some included custom dial plan files inside of Asterisk that you can go and write your own dial plan that will get included back into free PBX's dial plan to give you any of the flexibility you need beyond what we've designed for business logic for you. Okay. So, so if I, if I wanted to uh, customize the dial plan in a way beyond what free BX is allowing me to do that, that option is possible. It's, it's yes. possible in a lot of, it's possible in most scenarios. Yes. Um, in scenarios where maybe you want to modify how we're writing out extensions, the extensions.com for an extension. That you're not gonna be as flexible for, but free PBX being modular designed, any module can hook into another module. So a lot of times when somebody wants something custom done, we'll just whip up a, a simple, or they will whip up a simple PHP module that just hooks into the extension module and allows them to manipulate the dial plan any way they see fit. Okay. Um, so free PBX is kind of a, it utilizes a lot of, of, of Asterix. Is there any kind of PBX feature that free PBX has that Asterix doesn't have? Actually, a, a lot of the features in free PBX are not coded Asterix features. And we'll give an example, something in Asterix, such as app voicemail. App voicemail itself is a C level programmed application in Asterisk that doesn't allow you without recompiling the C to change its behavior. So there are things that we want to do in voicemail that weren't available in voicemail, so we create some patches to it. So one example is, yes, we patch Asterisk at times for features we need. 
The other example is we write a lot of what's called AGI scripts in, in different macros and the way we do dial plan to build the logic the way our customers and users have asked for. For example, follow me. Astrick has an application called App Follow Me. And our ISO is very limited what you could do with it. And our users want much more flexibility follow me. So we rewrote follow me inside our own business logic for people. Okay. How much of that code gets contributed back to Asterix? All of the code that he just mentioned right now, the follow me, um, the, the app voicemail, that is, uh, it's, well, I should say that's all contributed back to free PBX because that's all PHP level code. Um, Asterix doesn't really have anything to do with any PHP level code. Uh, the company ourselves, we all do patches. I did a patch against, um, uh, it's called Motif and XMPP, but it's really Google Voice, but that's a C-level program for Asterisk written by Digium or Asterisk. Um, you know, I did a patch for it and I submitted it back to Asterisk. Uh, Philippe, the project lead, has done numerous patches back to Asterisk for free. Uh, Brian Walters, another uh, developer from our company, has also done numerous patches. So as much as... Uh, you know, we do the free GUI and, and everything. We also try to submit patches back to Asterisk as much as possible because we try to have free PBX running on the stock, stock standard version of Asterisk. We don't want it to be running on, well, you have to patch Asterisk uh, with seven different patches from here and eight different patches from here to be able to use free PBX. Okay, so most of the stuff that, most of the code that gets contributed back, Asterisk related, is specific bug fixes that you guys find within Asterix. It's not like customizations that you have made to get P free BBX working. There, there comes time that we will do a feature or two. Um, and Asterix was what I call brain dead and not allowing us to do what we wanted to do. So we'll build the feature and give it back to Digium. So we just submitted actually this week, some changes to their res present state stuff that we're working on some new features in free PBX. So we wrote the patch for it and sent it up to review board and it got approved this week and going into Asterisk 11. And we do this every year, you know, maybe a half a dozen times where there's something that we need that isn't in Asterisk and we could work around it and kind of hack it, but it's not the right way. So we'd rather just get a patch into Asterisk and let the whole, everybody outside of even free PBX be able to benefit from that change. Gotcha. Um, so I, I think this answer was answered in one of the, the questions I answered, but what language is FreeBX primarily written in? It's, uh, it's written in PHP. So it's, uh, you've, if you've heard the word LAMP stack online, we consider this to be a LAMP uh, stack, which means um, Linux, Asterisk, MySQL, PHP, and then Apache. Well, really Apache would be first. But, so it's written on PHP and it utilizes MySQL as the back end. What was the... Um what was the reason why PHP was chosen as the as the language for this? You know, I would say that probably the reason PHP was chosen, um, it was actually originally started by a coalescent group back in 2004, 2005. I think that it was just easier for them to use PHP at the time. And um, at some point it was turned modular. So that means that um, <clears throat> you, you can load up a certain subsection of a uh, free PBX part that's just a it's just a few PHP files. You can upload it, and it's a module that connects into the main FreePBX um, subsystem, right? So because it's it's just been started as PHP, it's just continued PHP. Okay. Um, I mean, I would say it's just because it was easier, probably in the in the past. They maybe they just knew PHP. Um, those developers, the original what four or three guys, are actually really hard to get a hold of. So. Um, it's hard to say what their reasoning or determination was to use PHP. Well, and you, you kind of have to look at 2005. You kind of have to look at 2005, and at that time, PHP was all the rage. When free PBX was first started, it was an easy web language to use. Right, right. Um, so shifting gears a bit, I, I'm wondering what the most interesting thing you guys have heard of, of someone using FreeBX, free PBX for? Okay. Um, I think we hear weekly from people using it all over the place. I mean, well over a million production active systems currently in production. Um, you know, I, I, I've heard of things, you know, universities and schools using it for just even simple one school system using it as a voicemail system with over 20,000 voicemail boxes using free PBX to manage and configure their voicemail boxes. Um, 
nothing jumps out on top of my head as like a really cool thing because I guess we just hear them daily that it's just a second nature to hear about the things people are doing with it. Hey, uh, so looking at that in terms of scaling, how would you, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, you know, measure how much hardware you're going to have to have to manage a given set of uh, phones and stuff? That's the age old question that people ask all the time that we can never really give a real answer to meaning it depends what type of con you're doing. Are you doing hardware transcoding or any software transcoding? Are you doing a lot of conference rooms, which add more resources or a lot of queuing? Um, we generally say something like an atom board, just a, a simple modern day atom board with two, two gigs of memory. You know, you're going to get, anywhere from 30 to 50 simultaneous calls in that box without breaking a sweat. But, I mean, you can go as low as getting five to seven calls on a Raspberry Pi or a uh, Beagle board. I mean, those are out there. Um, they don't necessarily support all the features. You can't make 30, 50, 100 calls on something like that, but it, it, you can load up Asterisk, you can load up Free PBX, you can load up the whole Lampa stack and put it on there and test it out with five to seven calls, Google Voice, uh, VoIP provider, anything you want. Well, that sort of begs the next question, which is what platforms will this run on? Do I need a particular flavor of Linux? Do I, can I run this on FreeBSD if I prefer that? So there's two parts to FreePBX. There's the FreePBX GUI, which is what FreePBX originally started as, which can run on basically any LAMP stack you pick. Um, and then there's the FreePBX distro, which is a complete ISO that includes um, whatever different flavors of, of, they're all based on CentOS at the time. so from CentOS 5 all the way up to the latest 6.5 that just came out last week, we have pre-compiled ISOs for you that you can use that will install everything, including Asterisk and Dottie and all the utilities you need. You probably don't have to scale the web GUI because that's basically being used by some administrators, right? So um, yeah, probably in a lot of high availability or high bandwidth on that. But uh, can the, can the, can you, you cluster the uh, the actual engine that's doing the, uh, the the web calls, and does it sort of handle that automatically, or do I need to do a lot of thinking about how to have uh, bandwidth spread out over a number of machines? As far as load balancing your calls, um, it's not anything really Free PBX itself handles. Free PBX configures Asterisk, and Free PBX is on the same box as Asterisk. Um, as far as high availability for failovers and stuff. There's a complete new HA solution. It's one of the one of the commercial solutions that we offer that gives a true HA with heartbeat, floating IPs, um, you know, pacemaker and DRBD and everything configured for you. All you need to do is know your floating hmm. IP address, plug it in, and it sets everything up for you. Well, that's awesome. Very cool. And you talked earlier about intermodule communication and modules using each other. Uh, is it, what's the protocol on that? Is that uh, like a text-based protocol, or do you have to use a particular language with a particular RPC? Uh, it's all PHP. So um, we have some coding guidelines and standards, and uh, it just depends on what the modules have said is a hook. Um, so if I upload... Uh, a module that extends some voicemail stuff, I have to already expect that the voicemail module that we've written in PHP, this all in PHP, um, already has the hooks established so that I can call those for my module. Um, you can upload them, you can get them from our repository. People uh, can work on them privately and upload them. You know of a few people who have uh, worked on some private stuff for their companies where they just upload these modules in internal. We never see them, but um, they're hooking and linking and um, it's it's kind of ad hoc right now. Not every module has the same hooks. Um, different modules do hooking different ways. It's something that we're just improving over time. Um, the reason for that is because the project has been was started by three different people and then was transferred to another two different people and then was transferred to another five different people. You know, just like open source projects, they change over time. So there's some parts of Free PBX that are still 2004 code. There's some parts that are 2007. There's some parts that are 2013. So it's hard to say that, like if there's an RPC or a spec or um, for the modules. I mean, we're trying to improve that over time, but for right now, it just depends on whatever you're trying to hook into. You have to go look at it yourself. And, and how about integration that, with uh, Office, Office State? Sorry, go ahead. I was say part of that problem is we've consciously, 
we've debated for a long time of doing a complete rewrite of free PBX from the ground up. And it was started with what was called free PBX V3, which got spun off into what's currently the blue box project running on free switch. And we came to the conclusion that to do it is going to break everyone's systems out there. And, and we've been very conscious in free PBX from day one to not break systems on upgrades and always offer an upgrade pass. So we've changed the last two years and decided we're going to take big chunks of old free PBX code and rewrite them one chunk at a time in place so that we're not abandoning that user base of 1.8 million systems out there that are currently active and leaving them with no upgrade pass. So we're, we're going to take it one chunk at a time. And the, the current 2.12 we're working on is, is going to address some, some major core changes in the modular admin system in free PBX. Uh, as, as I'm administering this, I'm obviously, let's say I'm the, 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 um, the VoIP administrator for a small office, and I probably have like LDAP or some other kind of database that has like all the desks that everybody's sitting at and, and their names and probably their extension numbers. Is there an easy way to integrate that LDAP into FreePBX or is that is that at the wrong level? I don't know whether Asterisk can handle it directly, whether I could just tell Asterisk to go look, look it up all the time or... Is there some way to kind of bring that information across from, so I don't have to just retype it from a spreadsheet? Currently, no. There is a um, bulk import tool in FreePBX that you can use to add and edit users' extensions um, from CSV. But as far as like an LDAP integration, no, because a user has a lot of different information. And to go and set that all up in LDAP, you're talking probably 40, 50 different fields. In, in, that you would need to set up an LDAP to bring into free PBX. We've just never seen enough benefit to it. Okay, so there's a manual process involved there. So I, I still have a job, I guess. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, what uh, what's what's in the future for this? What, what, what's something coming up in the roadmap? What are the what are the features that are missing that you really want to have show up in the next six months to a year? I'll start on a couple and let Andrew hit on where he's kind of working on for the 12 stuff. Um, some of the features that we're really spending some time on right now is is twofold. Um, really wrapping free PBX around a proper REST API. So we've started a, a new REST API module that's trying to wrap most of the functions you can do from the free PBX GUI inside REST API so external applications can call it. And we've got a good chunk of that work done already, and we're actually using that REST API module to manage a new application called our REST apps, which mm -hmm. is building phone side apps um, for currently we're supporting all the Astra phones, the Yaling phones, and the Digium phones. So we might build something like a follow me management app, and it will work across and look and feel and function the same way across Astra, Yaling, and Digium even though those phones use completely different protocols to actually interact with apps on the phone. And that all talks back to the REST API inside of free PBX. Cool. And uh, tagging along on top of that REST API uh, functionality, Asterisk 12, which is coming out, which is in beta right now, um, and which is what we're writing our free PBX 12 version on uh, for, uh, utilizes REST API. So Asterisk now has a mini web server that uh, sends out that you can connect over WebSockets, you can do REST API, you can basically uh, generate your own voicemails like um, app. Instead of using the voicemail app we talked about earlier that's written in C, you can now uh, connect to it over REST API and WebSockets and generate your own voicemail app. So uh, in terms of free PBX 12, we're going to start linking into that. We're going to start using Asterisk 12's REST API. And uh, I mean, it looks really cool for the future of uh, Asterisk and free PBX. <laughs> so uh, what's uh, what's uh, Schmoozcom's business model? I'm sure there's like, uh, uh, you've got to figure out a way to, you know, pay for all the people that are there. And I, 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 you, may, you do hosting, do you do, um, I, or you got the hosting partner or whatever, uh, premium services, premium plugins, but uh, how else, how else does the business model work? So, for the last two years, our whole business is focused around free PBX. So every revenue, everything we do is around free PBX. We're a, um, we're a, we're a debt-free company with no outside shareholders, any outside investment money. Um, 
you know, we're just, we're just shy of, you know, we're around 20 employees, uh, most of them on development staff and then some sales and marketing and, and internal graphics and video guys. Um, but as far as our, our revenue, it's, it's all around the free PBX, what we call the ecosystem. So it's the different commercial add-ons, it's support contracts, um, it's consulting some, um, a lot more sometimes than we, we like. It seems that consulting is always distracting when you're trying to get a product out the door. Um, it's our hosting solution. It's our commercial version of free PBX called PB exact, which is a commercially supported version by us. It's the same free PBX code base with all of our commercial modules already included in it with a 24 by seven support contract from us and upgrades managed by us monitoring by us more of a, a turnkey fully supported solution for somebody who wants a single person to call and wring their neck. And then also a product we have called SIP Station that we purchased from bandwidth.com about a year ago, which is a uh, SIP trunking natively built into free PBX that makes setup and managing your, your SIP trunking really simple in free PBX. You go to our store, you buy the product you want, you get a key code, you paste that in your free PBX system and it auto sets up all your, your phone numbers you bought, the trunks that connect to us, all your routing and everything automatically for you. So what is your kind of, what is SchmoozeCon's typical uh, customer look like? Is it, is it someone that is using, currently using a, a, like an old style analog phone system or someone that's using like a really expensive VoIP solution and they, if they want to want something a little better, kind of what, what is, what does your typical customer look like? Our real typical customer is a free PBX user who is buying some commercial add-ons or buying our trunking service from us. Um, as far as like our, our commercial PBX, what our typical user is, it's generally more medium-sized businesses. There's a there's quite a few small businesses, but it's more medium businesses who need that single neck to ring when there's a problem. Um, so, you know, they're, I would say 75 to 1,000 extensions is our typical install on our commercial platform. So what is it about uh, about free PBX and, and the solutions that you guys offer that, that appeals to them over, say, like a, an expensive 3Com system or like a, um, a VIA system? The, the freedom of choice. So, you know, free PBX, the word free isn't even though it's a free product and open source, it's not referring to the freeness of free PBX, it's referring to the freedom of choice. You know, we currently support auto configuring point and click setup of over 250 endpoints of SIP endpoints. So phones, overhead paging devices, uh, we support currently over 200 different PSTN cards that will auto set up and, and discover your, your PSTN cards for connecting to analog or pure eye. So it's, really the freedom of choice and the freedom of flexibility. We're not going to lock of, you into anything. That's good. Uh, how many of your, your kind of new customers are, are coming from those like expensive systems? Most of them actually do. So uh, for example, at our commercial level, they're either people who have free PBX systems in place, but they don't want to stick with just a open source free PBX, the management team or investors want more of a commercial product behind it. So they'll upgrade to our PB exact, or it's people who are on a, a legacy, what we call a legacy proprietary system already, and they want to move to something more flexible and open. And, but they don't once again, want to sit on a completely open source platform that they have no back and support and nobody, to, nobody to scream at. We do offer, you know, paid support for free PBX customers, but it, there's no SLAs and, you know, it's at the free PBX level only where if you're buying PB exact, we're supporting the hardware, the operating system and all the way up. Okay. Can you just talk a bit briefly about that PBX, PB, PB exec, is it? Okay. Yep. The kind of the, the differences between that and, and free PBX. So at its, at its core, it's free PBX with a, with a new skinning. So it doesn't have free PBX and it doesn't talk about free PBX in the actual GUI interface. And then it adds a whole bunch of commercial modules that you could buy on top of free PBX. Um, things like um, these rest apps we're talking about or our, our endpoint manager, which lets you manage over 250 devices or like our park pro, which lets you have multiple parking lots and, and share parking lots between users have public shared lots. So just a bunch of more lateral market features. 
Um, okay. And then, the, like I said, the big thing is the support. We we support it. We handle all upgrades from the kernel and the operating system all the way up to asterisk and everything else for you. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, but I just wanted to come in and ask our typical couple of questions we ask at the end of the show. Um, the most important one being, is there anything we didn't ask that you really wanted to make sure our, our audience is aware of? I anything? can't think of anything. Cool. Well, that's a <clears throat> sign of good preparation, I guess. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, and uh, first for Tony, I don't know how much of a programmer you are, but what's your favorite scripting language if you're a programmer? Oh God, I, my programming skills are limited to hacked up bash scripts in regexes that nobody else wants to touch. Otherwise I'm, I stay out of the development side of things. Thank God. Yeah. Well, wait a second. Regexes that nobody else wants to touch. Isn't that all of them? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and so you probably don't I, have, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I pride myself in Q&A. I do a lot of the Q&A here because otherwise I feel like I'm too disconnected from our own product. So I've become the king of Q&A in Schmooze and Free PBX. I find the things that nobody else could even dream would happen. And everyone everyone knows when they send it to me, there's a good chance if there's a problem, I'm going to find it. Wow, great. And so you're probably not much of a text editor guy, but if you had a favorite text editor, what would it be? It's Vim. Oh, God. All right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> can't get a winner on this show. <laughs> Cannot get a winner. Nobody does the Emacs anymore. What's yours, Randall? Randall? Emacs. Oh, Emacs. See, I'm still course. a Nano guy too. I use Nano a lot, and everyone makes fun of me. I, no, I try fine. to use Vim more, but Nano just is more intuitive to me. <laughs> oh yeah, it's because it looks like Emacs. I mean, it's like a yes. watered down Emacs. It's really cool. All right. Cool. Okay. So then over to Andrew. Uh, same first and second question, which is uh, first question be uh, what's your favorite scripting language? I bet I guess what it is. Uh, my favorite is probably it's Python. Well, it's not PHP. I, really? I work in PHP. I know PHP really well, but I know the fallacies of PHP and the downfalls, and I talk about it every day with the rest of the development staff um, because we just have to keep that realization of the language itself and, and what it is. So I know PHP the best. My favorite yep. is probably Python. I really like yep. Python 3. Yeah. Um, See, I can't, we I can't have, get a winner on this show. Oh, well, go ahead. <laughs> what, what's your favorite language then? Duh. Um, let's see. What would I write five books about and the number one user of Perl? Uh, okay. I just saw a graph that was showing it was going down over the years. The, the amount searches, of searches, searches for it are going down, but that's because everybody knows where to find stuff about it. Ah, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, yes. So yes, uh, that's that's probably my favorite language is, is Python. Um, and and PHP is the second, just because I know it so well. Yeah, and I'm going to lose on the text editor column too, right? It's Vim. <sighs> Oh, oh, God. A scoreboard over here is way offset on the right-hand side for a long time here. All right, anyway, I'm that's... Told only old, I'm told only old people use things like Nano and Emacs and, um, uh, God, when I first started it, well, Pico. Pico was the other one I used to use. I'm told I, I, everyone nowadays uses everyone nowadays uses Vim, and they sit at Starbucks with their Mac laptops. Yeah, yeah. Or they use uh, those cool editors that the Ruby guys were using with the cool uh, text edit, text mate, something like that. The, the all the cool little triangles that ex expose things and stuff. But whatever. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Now I'm going way off topic. But first off, I just want to say thank you guys both for coming on the show and telling us about Free PBX. Hopefully, we've stirred up some interest for you and what it is. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. That was uh, Tony Lewis and Andrew Nagy talking about. Uh, both their company Schmoozcom and about FreePBX, which is the service they support. Uh, what do you think, Gareth? Uh, it definitely sounds interesting. I mean, I like the fact that, like, the, the question I asked of, of whether or not you could use FreePBX to manage your asterisk system, but at the same time be able to customize your your, your configuration to your dial plans. I mean, that that's in my book that that's a big uh, that's a big plus. Well, you had a really great uh, you had a really great question somewhere in the middle there, where you're talking about you know how GUIs can get complicated when you're trying to manage lots of complex things, and uh, that was a nice little discussion going on there. I've seen that so often, and especially when it's like you know well, we'll just put a simple GUI up in front of this really complex system because obviously it makes it easier for other people to use. But then the problem is, what if we want to do something that's slightly outside the GUI? At what point do you have to cross that great chasm between uh, drag and drop and put my you know my phone trunk over here and my, my you know my other stuff over there? And then um, and then it's like no, but I also need to do high availability. So that system's actually two systems. And where do I type that in in my GUI? Um, really great problem there. Um, 
And uh, I said, yeah, it was interesting. Great talking to these guys. Uh, I apologize for uh, a couple of dropouts I had on the during the show and a couple of really bad soundings I probably had on there. Uh, anything else, Gareth, before we uh, move on to the what I usually do at the end? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's I, I, I encourage everyone to go check it out if they're they're interested in phone systems. If their company is using a, a big, expensive commercial phone system, they should definitely check out free BBX. It looks interesting. Mm, Definitely cool. So we do have some upcoming guests. Actually, this, the list is entirely different from the last time I was on this show. You guys have really been great at knocking out everybody that was on my previous upcoming guest list. Uh, next week, uh, we have Magnolia and Blossom, which all I know about them so far is they're a Java content management system. So Magnolia, I think, is the base thing, and Blossom sort of some plugins for it. I probably got that entirely wrong. Uh, sadly, next week, I'll be coming to you from the same location, and hopefully the Clearwire modem will not uh, be as, as, uh, as complainy as it was today. I was going to say another word that started with a B, but I want to keep this clean. Um, following that, we have no shows. Uh, it just happens that Christmas and New Year's this year both fall on a Wednesday, and that means that we won't be doing any shows for two weeks in a row. We'll just be celebrating the holidays. Actually, I'll be on a cruise ship, so it won't really matter. It'll be great. I get to spend both Christmas and New Year's on the Queen Mary 2, heading down and back from New York to the Eastern Caribbean, hitting five islands there, which will be a lot of fun. Uh, coming right back the first of the year, though, We'll have Arcos, which is data hosting that works on a Raspberry Pi. So if you ever wanted your um, data in, in a cloud, but the little cloud being right next to you over there rather than being in some weird cloud somewhere else, um, it's a full like web, web dev system and file system, things like that, but all running on a Raspberry Pi. That's all the rage these days. I hope we get um, Aaron on that one because Aaron is a big Raspberry Pi fan. And then a few weeks later, just added to the schedule. Actually, all these were just added to the schedule since the last time I was on. We got Go. We got Go. We're going to talk about the board language. You know, you're on little squares. You put black and white stones. No, 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 no. The programming language from Google, it's been being run. Um, uh, uh, it was, it's actually been around for a few years now. It's a high-performance, uh, multi-threaded language. Uh, does a lot of scaling, things like that. It's been quite the rage. Um, this is similar in some ways to Dart, which we actually talked to a little while back, and they sort of dovetail a little bit. They're sort of non, they're somewhat overlapping problem spaces, but but uh, Go seems really interesting. Um, we got one of the key developers on Go. I don't have his name in front of me, sadly. We are continuing to fill in Q1, though. Of course, I hope by the time we get the uh, first show done in Q1, we have a show for the second week and the third week and the fourth week. I do have about three or four people that are in just negotiations about the actual date, so it should just be a matter of me sending out email now that I'm back on land again. Uh, you can always follow us on twitch.tv slash floss uh, oh sorry we don't follow us there you go there it's been a while since it's been a show sorry you go to twitch.tv slash floss we have the big spreadsheet there link, linked from there that talks about who we've got coming up and if you see somebody you know if you don't see somebody on the list that should be email me merlin at stone uh, and either talk to the project leader or give me the project leader's email address don't make me hunt that down don't say i just want this project on there it doesn't do me any good it, it, i just put that on the longer list and you'll, you'll never get to it so uh all these people have been shortlisted people that uh, we've had recently in the show you can uh, follow us at floss weekly on google plus i try to post notes there as i schedule each additional person uh, i also try to uh, uh just before the show announce who today's guests are we also have a Twitter handle called Floss Weekly, all one word. Uh, we have a live chat room. We did take a couple of questions from the chat room, or we tried to take questions from the chat room, but Skype chat was being really mad at me today. Um, and uh, that's uh, live.twit.tv at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. Of course, the spreadsheet gives you specific times. We have to move it away from that. You can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. Uh, you can also follow me as Randall L. Schwartz on Google+. Plus. I have about 23,000 followers there now, and we chat about various things, including uh, open source software, uh, humor I may find during the day, um, my uh, low-carb, high-fat uh, lifestyle and diet and health uh, kick, um, and all sorts of things. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the show, I've just come back from two cruises. I was around South America uh, on a uh, round-the-horn trip, like 12-day, I think that was, and the... Uh, cruise I just flew back from was going down the Rhone River. Uh, that was really awesome. We started out going to CERN, which is where the Large Hadron Collider is. We had special privileges to be able to actually go down into the tunnel. That's really rare. Even when the scientists that work there, unless they actually need to work in the tunnel, they don't go down in the tunnel because uh, it's a restricted access. But we have connections there. So actually on Thanksgiving Day, you can actually see my tweets and my pictures on that if you look at my streams, where I actually got to be right across from the, um, the CMS experiment. And it was pulled open so they could 
get access to the inside and we're doing some diagnosis on the inside. Man, that was just amazing. Just an awesome, this 12 story high machine, just the biggest machine in the world. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then from there we went down the road and then I ended up in Barcelona and then I spent 26 hours getting from there back to Portland, Oregon. What an amazing travel experience. Uh, and then coming up again, I'm gonna be going out to, uh, out of New York on the Queen Mary 2 down to um, uh, Eastern Caribbean, five islands down there. Uh, for those of you who know that I've been looking for work, I just signed a contract yesterday. It's an open-ended contract, so I'm looking to get uh, probably six months to a year to two years of work out of them. Uh, it's um, mostly in L.A. Well, it's partly in L.A. They're actually based here in Santa Monica. But uh, I get to work remotely most of the time, so I may actually be working from home for a while, which would be really nice to sleep in my own bed. Uh, I've been asked by... Uh, ben Everhard, who's with the Linux Voice podcast, Linux Voice magazine and Linux Voice podcast. They're just starting up, linuxvoice.com. You can go check them out. Uh, and I may, I'm may i I'm talking about them. I don't normally plug other podcasts, but I, they are actually going to be interviewing me soon. It was supposed to be done by the time this podcast happened, but uh, with all my travel schedule, it just didn't work out. So... Um, so we just, uh, um, uh, so go check out LinuxVoice.com. They have a few episodes of their podcast up already, and they will be interviewing me soon. That's really about the only way I mention other podcasts is if they interview me. That way I can talk about them here. Um, I will also be attending, thanks to now I have this new gig here in uh, SoCal, I will be attending SoCal Linux Expo. Uh, I don't know whether I'm doing it as press, or I may be doing my, uh, if I get together my proposal before Friday, uh, I'll, be, I'll be doing my uh, Half-Life with Pearl talk there, because that's been really well-received a few times I've done it before that. And Gareth, of course, that's your cue to talk about SoCal Linux Expo. Scale, I've heard of that. Yes. Uh, nice uh, nice segue there. Um, so, yes, yeah, Scale is the Southern California Linux Expo. It's happening February 21st through the 23rd, 2014, in um, hopefully warm, sunny Los Angeles. Um, the, our call for papers is still open. Like you said, it, it ends on the 15th. Um, so if, if anyone is interested in speaking at the show, you have uh, a couple days to get your proposal in um, for consideration. Um, if anyone's interested in attending, uh, we are offering a discount code of F-L-O-S-S, -S. make sure I get that right, uh, for a 50% uh, discount on a full access pass to the show. Cool, cool, and uh, that's great. So, I, yeah, so I'm definitely going to be there. Uh, I'm working out my travel schedule now to make sure that I'm going to show up. Um, and like I said, I'm either going to want to ask to be press and just recover this last weekly and do a lot of interviews, or uh, like I said, I probably, I've got this presentation that if you, if the steering committee is so willing, I can actually uh, give the talk. So, cool. All right. Well, anything else before we get wrapped up, Gareth? I wanted to say I was extremely jealous that you got to see the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. Yeah. Yeah, that looked yeah, awesome. Yeah. The pictures looked awesome. Be, being the alpha geek in a lot of areas is really handy. Also, having been on 60, that was my 69th cruise. So, uh, you know, being the right cruise at the right time. We saw, we were at the LHC on a previous cruise, but it was actually operating. And, of course, that means the whole area where I was would be fatal to people. Um, not to mention highly magnetic, which is really weird. They have to be careful with their laptops that uh, they don't get it too close to there. There's a painted mark on the ground. When the system's actually running, they can go in adjacent tunnels, but not the actual live tunnel. And there's a line on the ground that they can't go across because their laptops will be demagnetized. So it's really sort of screwy. But, yeah, so we didn't actually get to go down to the tunnels last time, but to actually have stood by... You know, and been right at we were right at beam level basically at the CMS. So there was there was a giant thing pulled apart. You've probably seen pictures of that, uh, and it was just it was just amazing. It was such a privilege. Uh, too bad we only had one day there. We could have taken more time to see a lot of other things. Uh, anyway, yes, cool. Uh, and thank you for being jealous. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what a crazy way to say that. But of course, you know, bandwidth permitting. We'll see you all again next time on Floss Week. <laughs>